Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Subtext Podcast Archives. These are the long lost episodes of the Subtext that were originally produced between 2015 and 2017. In 2018, the Subtext moved to American Theatre Magazine, and we've been producing the pod there monthly ever since. These time capsules are being shared here in their entirety including plenty of outdated references and advertisements for events far in the past. If you enjoy them, please subscribe to the current podcast feed for the subtext or stream new episodes on the website for American Theatre Magazine. Thank you for listening. Welcome to the subtext. My name is Brian James Polak. Thank you for listening. If you like what we're doing, please go to iTunes and give us a rating and leave a comment. It means a lot to my ego and will help us get this podcast into more ears. This month's episode is sponsored by New Play Exchange. The New Play Exchange is flipping the script on the way playwrights and producers find each other. It's the world's largest cloud-based database of new scripts, enhanced with robust search and filter tools, crowdsourced recommendations of plays from industry professionals, a targeted opportunities module, and smart social networking. Sign up at newplayexchange.org and start exploring. And this isn't part of the ad, and I'm not paid to say this, but I literally, over the past couple months, have had two opportunities come specifically because my plays are on New Play Exchange. So kudos to NPX. This month's guest is playwright and actor and screenwriter John Polono. He grew up in New Hampshire and came to Los Angeles to become rich and famous. He's basically a handsome, successful version of me. Whatever you got. Well, those, uh, I mean, those scalpers are ruthless. They get so much damn money for that. Yeah. It's amazing. It's like yeah. a phenomenon. I mean, that's just what happens. Is, I mean, I, I didn't see the show. Like I said, the, the, the uh, Spotify, Hamilton's playing pretty much nonstop in my house for my daughter and her friends. They're all way into it. I mean, it's kind of cool because, like, I mean, you get these 10, 11-year-old girls, like, kind of into history. Mm-hmm. And, you know, yesterday's 4th of July and the fireworks are going off and my daughter turns to me and she's like, this is kind of, you know, the Independence Day. This is like when Hamilton was around. Like, she knows the history. Right. Which is kind of cool, you know. Um, and, and the musical, we drove to Texas uh, last Christmas. It's a long fucking drive. And we literally listened to Hamilton in its entirety probably twice which is three and a half hours each time. Right. You know? So, um, and she filled me in on everything. And it's great. Uh, <clears throat> I just don't get to see it. I get to stay home. It's kind of amazing, though, that uh, that's the context I'm hearing a lot with parents and their kids. Like, it's giving an entry point into history that yeah. our generation never had. Like, was there anything historically interesting? Remember that musical you had to watch in history class? And I know you're from New Hampshire like me, where we're like, the Founding Fathers musical. Do you remember what the hell that was called? No, no. I'll have to Google it later. It no. had the. De- you remember? Uh, what was that show where it was like the husband and wife and they were spies and it was like in the eighties? Right heart now, for heart versus heart or something like that. Heart to heart. Heart to heart. Remember that I was show? I think the Americans. because no, 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 that's no, what's no, going no. on. I'm talking right about now. a long time ago. So yeah. like the lead guy in Heart to Heart was the lead guy in this thing. That's oh what god, what the hell is that guy's name? We'll spend the entire hour just like trying, trying to, to figure, figure out the guy's name. Where we could just pick up our iPhone and yeah, where's the fun of that? <laughs> but you know that was a thing they showed, and it wasn't really particularly done. But I mean, they, you know, whatever. There's been a million words said on Hamilton, um, but I mean, it's great. Our kid, uh, my daughter Sophie, you know, she grew up in the theater because my wife and I have always had theater companies and rehearsed at our right. house and do all that stuff. So she definitely kind of digs theater. Um, she just did a play at PRT actually, which was really cool. Mm-hmm. Um, And so she's into it. She kind of likes it. But, I mean, she's never been able to see anything that I've been a part of or done, you know, unfortunately. I tell her when she's older. And even though, like, I dedicated one play to her, she's like, when can I see this or read it? And I was like, oh, maybe when you're Mm, 17. I mean, now she's, what, 11, you said? Yeah, she's 11. She's she's about, you know, in that age where your your adult brain is starting to, to form. She is, and she's at this funny age where, like, she want, She's super curious about everything, but at the same time, she thinks she finds comfort in being protected by her parents. Mm-hmm. Like, she kind of pushes the boundary, and I'll be like, no, you can't see that. And she'll be like, okay. Like, she didn't maybe really want to, you know? Mm-hmm. It's not like she's sneaking off and doing stuff. I mean, she's. I'm, we're lucky. She's a real great kid. She's very smart and, mm-hmm. and, like, super smart. And 
like way into politics and you know what's right and what's wrong and you know it's interesting because like like you you know we grew up in an area that was very socially conservative and just more like working class like man is a man type stuff mm -hmm. and then you grow up you know kind of rebelling against a lot of that and that's why you become so much more liberal especially if you're into the arts and stuff like that you kind of look at the world differently whereas you know it's funny because i see my daughter and she's so political and so like for gay rights and women's rights and so vocal against any oppression of anyone and i'm kind of like as cool as that is, it's also she's very much conforming to her parents. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, is she, what's her form of rebellion going to be like? I wonder. That's you good. know to yeah. be like a Trump supporter or whatever. Yeah. I mean, like she fucking hates Donald Trump. And, and is so she getting that from from school from you? <clears throat> well, you know, kids talk about it, and, and it's sort of a little scandalous thing. Like, oh, do you know so and so's family likes Donald Trump? I mean, look, we live in L.A. You know what I mean? It's yeah, like, uh, yeah. We were at the Westchester parade yesterday for her school. And her little school does like a thing, and they do this every year. And uh, two floats behind her was a Donald Trump float. And all it was was like a giant diesel, uh, like moving truck. And on the side, they had written some Donald Trump stuff. And in the back, there were some like Bible quotes. And it was really weird, man, because it's like it was like three or four people, and then a couple people walking around with Donald Trump shirts. And everybody was booing them. And they're just like waving their flag and laughing and antagonizing a little bit. And you know, it was like a black lady. And then there was like some old white dude. I mean, it was a really strange crowd. Yeah. You know? and, and it was just such a weird thing to be like, well, I mean, what are you doing? I mean, I suppose that kind of stuff exists everywhere, but. I don't know, man. I don't get that movie. And my daughter, too. It's like, she's like, the guy's such an asshole. He's so mean. Why do people support him and all that? You know, she doesn't understand it. You know, I think about, I think a lot about, and it's 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 good to have uh, somebody else from New Hampshire to talk to. Right. Because I think a lot about what it's like to be from New Hampshire, what people are like from New Hampshire, because they're right. not like, they're not like other people in New England, and they're not like people I know around right. here. No. You know, they're not. You know, crunchies like Vermonters. You know, you know, it's just so different. And it's I it's almost like a weird militia quality to New Hampshire. It's like get off my lawn, get off my lawn, live free or die, and I'm good yeah. if you just like stay the hell away from me. Yeah, separatist, libertarian type shit. But yeah, we went, went to this past summer. We hung out. Uh, we were in Boston, and we went up for the weekend to hang out with my family. And uh, they live up in Pembroke. Mm -hmm. And, you know, driving up there, again, my daughter saw all these Donald Trump signs festooning the front lawns of all these different houses. And she was like, what? How can this be? But you're right, man. New Hampshire is a weird little thing because it is to have that crazy gun-toting conservatism. But at the same time, all these colleges, people are very enlightened in many, mm -hmm. many ways. And, you know, the primary is being there. It's like a very, you know, the, those those fuckers, they hit it hard in mm -hmm. New Hampshire. You know what I mean? Yeah. For those votes. Yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting place. How... Well, when I when I grew up, I went to a public school. Did you go to a public yeah. school? So I went to a public high school, public junior high school, and a lot of kids were into theater and into the arts through school. Right. I wasn't. I was into sports through school, and then grad. You know, I finished school. I go to college, and at some point, I find my way to the arts. And the opposite was true for pretty much everybody else that mm. I know. Like most people who were in the arts and school kind of fall out of it and it was sort of a school activity to do like and a hobby yeah so w was that the same for you i was experience? exactly like you i mean i was so into sports and um you know like my group of friends which meant a lot to me um were not and you know like they didn't give a fuck that i did anything creative it just wasn't their thing you know i wrote stories and shit and like they didn't read it they were like that's so and funny. you were writing in high school yeah i mean i started <laughs> I was so into Stephen King, like mm -hmm. obsessed with Stephen King. So I used to write all these sort of horror short stories. When I was in third grade, I, it's so fucking funny, man. I just tell my wife this. When I was in third grade in Londonderry North School mm -hmm. in Londonderry, which was like the north part of town, not quite as nice. Our like elementary school was across the street from a junkyard. And it's like <laughs> the playground was a bunch of these tires bolted onto old telephone poles. I just can't believe they let the kids play with them. Yeah. Or they take a giant tractor tire, half submerge it in the dirt. And you'd play on that. Right. But anyway, so when I was there, they had this, like, writing contest. And I read this book. I forgot what it was called, but it was, like, about a boy who had a little pet raccoon. And I loved this book. Like, in second grade, I read it, like, ten times. So it came time to write the story. And I just – I didn't even really realize it. I literally, like, plagiarized it. <laughs> like, I changed the name of the raccoon. I had him, like, have a girlfriend raccoon. I mean, I added some new shit, but, like, the signature image of the book was he would ride – 
his little bike and the raccoon would be in the front little basket. Yeah. Like, you know, the wind blowing in the raccoon's face. And, like, that was, like, literally the drawing on the front of my fucking little story. And, like, it won this young author's conference. And I went to, like, Concord and got an award mm-hmm. and all this shit. And then, I mean, I completely... How just, old were you? I mean, third grade. I mean, how you know, I was, I was just a dumb little kid. And uh, I remember the teacher afterwards, she's like, did you copy this book? And I was like, well, you know, I, there was some cool pictures. Like, I just literally didn't know what it was. But yeah. now that I look back at it, I'm like, it was my first foray into writing. And um, so that was cool. So, like, I just remember as a writer, I don't know about you, but you, so you didn't write back then, you're saying? No, I was writing, like, really sad, woe is me, I right. love this girl poetry. <laughs> oh, Jesus. Yeah. I wish we had some of that right now. Like, uh, it was pretty terrible, and it lasted for, that's all I wrote, and I didn't consider it writing. Right. I considered it, I'm sad. <laughs> you, you know, it's it's funny, man. It's like you you study that shit. Yeah. So anyway, so I, I yeah, I was like you. I uh, I, I kind of hit it. I was like a closeted artist. Yeah. And then I went to I I really wanted to go to NYU, and uh, just we didn't have the money. My dad. I mean, God bless him, man. My my dad and bought these tenement housings in, in uh, Manchester, New Hampshire. It's kind of slums, right? Yeah. And we go there and fix them up, and I'd go help him out and do shit like that, and and. Uh, you know, yeah, I remember going over there. People would like drag the mini fridge out the out the window and just destroy the window, and just because they wanted to keep the fridge, but it's like their deposit was more. I mean, it was a mess for years. He did. It was real stress for my dad, and so he had to get rid of them and he had to declare bankruptcy. So his idea was originally to sell those tenement houses, you know, take right. that money and then like pay for our college. So that just didn't quite work out. Um, you know, it was like the late '80s, early '90s, so. The market kind of crashed. Right. And then so I went to UNH and I wanted to go to NYU to be like, I want to be around artists and like the, like the closeted aspect of me. I mean, it literally did parallel a lot of my friends, especially from New England, who were came out of the closet, who were gay. Yeah. I really relate to that experience of living somewhere where you can't be your true self. You know what I mean? Like I find a lot of those parallels a lot of times with creative people when they kind of come from that area. Yeah. Where you're like sports, super acceptable, getting into a fight, that's acceptable. But going home and writing a short story. I mean, like, if you wrote a poem to get laid, okay, bro, that's okay, maybe. But uh, I don't know. I don't know. Probably not. Yeah. (laughs) I mean, not to, nobody knew. I mean, like, my my close, like, female. Did you give it to girls? One. I mean, there was one girl I wrote. I was, I was like that scary, infatuated kid. Yeah. I wrote 50 poems about this girl. Oh, that's kind of scary. And I loved her. And I thought that if she ever knew, she'd be so psyched. (laughs) No, it's not actually true. Yeah. She was not so psyched. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. Shocking. Yeah. Yeah, dude, it's that young love is intense, man. It's terrible. It really is. It's yeah. like you just need to get through it, man. You just, it needs, yeah, it just needs to happen. You need to have it fail, and then you yeah. need to move on with your life. Oh, I know. I, yeah. I, I but always, you can't tell a person that. You can't tell, you can't tell your, your children this. No. They have to just experience well, it. Well, it's like telling somebody who's like deeply has pneumonia to be like, you're going to be better in three days. It's like, I don't care. I feel like shit right, right yeah. now. I can't foresee a future where I don't feel like this. Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly what it's like. <laughs> so you ended up at UNH. Yeah, I went to UNH and I studied. You know, I had an English major. They didn't have a filmmaking cr- thing, which is what I really wanted to get into, and they didn't really have creative writing. So I was in English, but I took a lot of creative writing classes. But you know, did you? What did you say you went? I went to Marymount University in Virginia. Oh right, right. Yeah. I knew it was kind of out of the out of the thing. But you would knew. Well, sure that was I mean. my that was my thing. My, uh, my family didn't have a ton of cash. And when it came time to, I wasn't I wasn't particularly academic, right? In, in as a high schooler, you were in, you were dumb. You got that yeah, grade. yeah, yeah. Uh, so, which is cool. It, it was like college time, and yeah. I wasn't even like yay college. I was like, oh, my friends are going. I guess I'm supposed to go totally. too. So I went to I went to a college fair, uh, uh, Saint Anselm College. Yes, hosted this college fair every year. And I went. The gym is full of a couple hundred schools from around the country. Uh-huh. I went and collected a bunch of things, like pamphlets and whatnot. Brought them back to my my uh, my bedroom at home. And my and like a month later, my mother's like, "So where do you want to apply?" And I'm like, "I don't know. I don't. <laughs> it's it's like November, you know, and applications are due in a month." And I'm like, "I don't. I don't know." And I started to go through this giant pile, and. Uh, all I knew was I wanted to get the fuck out of New Hampshire. Yeah. Like, that's all I could think about. My older sister was at UNH at the time. Yeah. My mom worked at Keene State College, so she's, like, leaning on me heavy to go to Keene State or UNH because mm-hmm. tuition's super cheap. Totally. So she's like, you're applying to Keene State, you're applying to UNH, 
and I'll let you apply to one other school. So I went through this giant pile and I looked for a college that was away from New Hampshire and that was small because I mm-hmm. knew that I'd die at a, at a large school. Hmm. Got into Keene State, got into UNH, and got into this tiny little Catholic college called Marymount in That's Arlington, crazy. Virginia. And then uh, I begged my mom to let me go, and I got a good package, like a student yeah. loan package. So she let me go there, and that's where I ended up going. And you, st- what did you study there? Philosophy. Oh wow! But nothing. But I didn't really study anything because the philosophy I, is yeah. It's one of those things that uh, well, it's just funny like hearing you talk about that because I remember those little college things. But the reality is, is like <laughs> it's kind of like dating. Like if the college wants you, it's probably not as good of a college. Yeah. <laughs> You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Like, if you don't have to put any effort in, if it's like, please like me, it's like a needy college. Right. Whereas opposed to the colleges, you know, that are more sought after that, like, okay, try to get in, fuck you. Yeah. Then they tend to have it. I mean, look, man, I, you know, I, I totally hear that. I, I, I was pretty upset that I had to go to UNH, but at the same time, I think there was some comfort in that because I knew everybody. Yeah. <clears throat> but then I had really bad wanderlust. I ended up doing an exchange. I was supposed to go. My senior year, I was going to do an exchange in, to Australia. And I, you know, th- did all the paperwork. I was, like, dialed in. I missed signing up for classes at UNH. I had it all. And then uh, I was like, it's going to be fucking awesome. And I was da- I was deeply in love and dating this girl. And she was like, what's going to happen to us? But I was like, you know what? I'm not going to think about that. I just need this adventure in my life. And then uh, they gave you the name of a couple people who went out to UNH and did the exchange at this. And I was, I literally, I picked a school in the Northwestern Territories. It was, like, in the middle of fucking nowhere. Mm-hmm. So I talked to this guy, and he's like, dude, you don't want to go out there. You'll, you'll go crazy. And he's like, and of course you're going to need like at least three or four thousand just for pocket money to travel because anywhere you go in Australia you got to fly and then all mm-hmm. this stuff because it's like you're not going to just want to stay there. And I was like, I'm literally going with five hundred dollars, so I had mm-hmm. to cancel it. <clears throat> and then uh, I had missed signing up for classes at UNH, so I was like, I got to do an exchange somewhere. And I did kind of what you did, where I was like, I just picked a school. I went to Eastern New Mexico University, this teeny little whatever. Where, uh, just because I was like, I've never been out west. I mm-hmm. want to try that. And just to kind of learn who you are, you know, so I drove out, you know, I flew out to this place in the middle of fucking nowhere. And, um, yeah, you kind of figure out who you are a little bit. Just to be, for once, not to be around everybody who's like you, who mm-hmm. likes the same sports teams as you and all that stuff. Yeah. So, uh, so yeah, that's pretty cool. And the, another bonus is that, at, at, at least at UNH, if you do an exchange, it's just a binary grading system. As long as you get over, like, a 70% percent mm-hmm. like a c minus it's either pass fail mm-hmm. so i took all those classes that i didn't want to take like french and statistics and bullshit you know what i mean mm-hmm. so you just kind of get through it and it was like an easy fucking school i mean it was so easy compared to unh in terms of the academic stress but yeah man i i mean i i totally get what you're saying you're like i just gotta get out of here i just gotta figure that out and uh and i mean i've i had real i don't know about you but obviously you had some wanderlust because you ended out here in la but i've always had that i've moved all over the place just to you know, New York City and, and New Mexico, Colorado, and finally. So you know, what, happened, what happened, what uh, happened, today you are, you're a playwright, you're a writer, screenwriter, playwright, actor. Yes. How did you get from being a guy who wrote some stuff, had some wanderlust as an undergrad, to living in L.A., doing what you're doing now? So, like, what was, <clears throat> was there, like, a thing that locked you into, I want to come to L.A. and do? Yeah, I mean, it was a very circuitous, <clears throat> meandering trip to get there. And, you know, when I say the parallel to being a closeted homosexual, I mean that in all sincerity, and I'm not trying to be facetious at all, in the sense of, for example, I knew in my heart what I wanted to do, but I didn't grow up in an area, and you can relate to this, that really said, hey, go for it. I mean, my parents were supportive in the sense of, like, go live your dreams, but they don't, they didn't have lives in the creative space. Well, I think when parents, at least the parents I know and have, they say go live your dreams, but they really mean... Be practical, get a real job, no, that's and go live your dreams on the weekends. Right. Yeah. I didn't have any model to do what I wanted to do. And when I, I went, ended up going to NYU <clears throat> for a summer course, I mowed lawns. I had a lawn mowing business through high school and college that I paid for, you know, in addition to financial aid, I covered it. And then I saved up to take a what is called a sight and sound class at NYU. It's a summer program. I couldn't go there full time, but I could afford whatever it was, like the four grand to take that class. So you go out there for like two months. It's like two semesters worth sort of combined. So I went out and it was the first time in my life I'd been around, you know, such diverse people, A, and B, like creative people. 
you know, and the, who didn't equate, uh, you know, creativity with like graphic gay sex and make fun of me for that, you know, so I could kind of be myself and be like, I love this. This is what I want to do. So that kind of unlocked something for sure. And I met a couple of people in that program who wanted a similar path. They're from New York City. So after I um, graduated from UNH, I moved out to Colorado with a girl. Uh, we lived in a mobile home and literally starved half the time because we had no money. And I wrote a couple things. I wrote a shitty novel. I mean, mm. it was the worst thing. And I wrote an even shittier screenplay. And prob- partially, partially because, I mean, like, I-, I believe there's a huge element of craft involved as, in terms of what we do. Mm-hmm. You know, um, I had the passion. <clears throat> I had, I always knew how to, like, create stories that would engage people. Like, for example, I grew up around, again, around people who did not give a fuck at all. They wouldn't sit there and be like, oh, my God, what do you have to say? Mm -hmm. So uh, one of the most formative, uh, creative moments of my life was when I was in high school. I had this teacher, and you would write short stories, and you would would read them to the class. So you'd have the whole class listening to you. And people would just write stupid shit. And I was like, it unlocked. That was the first moment in my life where I'm like, I wrote these outrageous, crazy, my version of Stephen King stories, but they were very funny and dark and raw. And people were like, holy shit, like asking for copies of it and going around. So that was like, oh, my God, I can do this, you know. So... Uh, anyway, I went out to Colorado. I wrote a bunch of shit. And then the plan was some of these guys I knew in New York, I was going to move out to New York and we were all going to, you know, rewrite American cinema, which mm-hmm. is so I did that. And uh, I wrote a ton. I lived a lot in isolation. I was poor as can be. I- I've always been sort of, uh, I don't know about you, but like, same thing, drawn by what's the practicality of it. Mm-hmm. I've never not had a job. Since I was 14, I've never not had a job, mm-hmm. some shitty job to pay the bills. And then even when I'm, like, going to New York City to make a movies, I'm, like, temping, I'm working at a bagel shop, I'm juggling these two things. You're fucking exhausted. You sit down there and you write. And most of the stuff I'm creating to get myself out of hole was, was really kind of shitty. It was derivative. I was trying to, like, anticipate the market. I was working with these other guys who were very wealthy and they had a different set of demands than I did. Made some short films and stuff. And then our plan was to all move out to L.A. together. It was about 15 years ago. And then, which we did, and within a couple of years, that those sort of creative relationships dissolved. But you you came to L.A. and you came with this crew, right, to be filmmakers. Yeah, we wanted to be like you know, uh, you know, like the old guys, like Lucas and Kasdan and Spielberg. You know what I mean? It was like that kind of thing. Um, we were brothers. We had met each other in film school, and and we were just so different, and we were on much different paths. And I mean, that was tough, you know. Uh, some toxic relationships there. I mean, mm-hmm. look, it's just, you know, they're just not meant to be. And, right. and I didn't really have, I, I feel like as a writer and as an actor, I didn't really have my voice. I, I just didn't know. I was, I felt really constantly guilty for wanting to do what I wanted to do, you know, and not really knowing it and really being kind of too much of a pussy to just assert myself and say, this is what I am. You know, I, I always had jobs. I always, you know, you show up for a job and you sit down and you want to make $15 an hour. And if you're like, I'm a writer and an actor, they're like, go fuck yourself. Mm-hmm. At least that was my feeling. So it'd be like, well, I'm here and I'm a hard worker and I always worked really hard. That was the only sort of value I had. And, you know, I grew up doing construction. I mean, I feel like I've had, and this is, again, this is a New England thing. I feel like I've had 70 jobs in my life. Yeah. You're always working. Yeah. Hey, go up the street, chip off all the ice off of every fucking driveway in the street and make, mm-hmm. like, pennies. Again, I had that long mowing business. I constantly installed irrigation systems, was a mover, did construction. I was a, paint- I was a terrible painter, but one summer I painted. Just constant backbreaking work. Right. Everybody works. They get out at the end of the day, go have a bunch of beers, get fucking loaded, and then you get up the next day and do it. I mean, that's, that's what it is. That's the DNA. How do you get from that to someone who has the audacity to create for a living. So then I went to, uh, I, I was working at the mail room at Castle Rock Entertainment right when I first got to LA. It's kind of a funny story. So like, <laughs> I was a temp at first. Someone wanted to kill Rob Reiner <laughs> or like <laughs> attack him. <laughs> like uh, they thought he stole an idea. I, dude, I don't know even, maybe I'm not allowed to tell anybody this, but it's, I think the statute of limitations are up. So they said he stole an idea. And like there was a guy, the FBI knew, and they were following him. And the receptionists were kind of real nervous to do that. And they were like, do you – and I was like, I don't, I don't care. They're like security guards there. I'm like, I don't fucking care. I just moved from New York City. I was like, bring it on. I was being a tough guy. 
So I sat in the front thing, and they gave me like a code thing where they had like a walkie-talkie there, and they're like, if somebody, if this guy comes in, there's like his picture right there. You know, he could be armed. Just pick up your your radio and say FedEx is here. I'm like, so there's a guy with like a gun in my face, and I pick up the radio and go FedEx is here. And hey, what do you do if <laughs> FedEx is there? Yeah, but anyway, uh, so they caught the guy then, but they liked me, and they kept me on, and then I delivered mail, and then. I got a job and as assistant to uh, the VP of publicity. Really great woman, like this gal, became really good friends. Mm -hmm. Then most of that department got laid off, and I ended up sort of far scumping my way into that thing. Are you writing this whole time? I I was and I was. So what happened is, is one of those guys, a guy named Phil Santani, who's still a friend of mine to this day. I met him in the mailroom like the third day. He's like, I can tell there's something about you. So he took it. He was taking an acting class at this conservatory, and he's like, you should check it out. Now, when I was in NYU and stuff, I acted, and I acted in a bunch of the short films, and I really liked it. But again, I was like, this is so, you know, I'm such a pussy. I can't say that I like it. And I was like, oh, I'm going to take acting classes to become a better writer. So I started taking this class, and you start, a, you got to start like at the intro one, you know, which was great. It was this teacher Laura Gardner, and at the Howard Fine Acting Studio. And it's like the, you know, it's like uh, you start and you learn like the super basic stuff. And a lot of it I felt so silly doing it. But mm-hmm. it kind of broke me in the sense that you got to kind of get to it. But the best thing of all about that is you don't you don't go home and do scenes of like Pulp Fiction and like Harry Met Sally or, you know, Seinfeld. It's like you do plays. And I had never – I'd been to one play in my life at that point. So I started to read all these plays and you'd see a scene from a play and you'd be like – Go up to some. Hey, can I borrow that play and read it? So I just I started to devour theater in a way. It really, and I didn't even see any of it performed, which is strange. But I would just read it, and I was like, the dialogues and the characters and the stories. It blew me away. I mean, I remember reading Death of a Salesman for the first time because I got the scene assigned to me. I mean, what a moron! It's like, you know, I'm in my mid twenties and I never even saw Death of a Salesman because I studied English. You study like you know fucking yeah. other shit like that, and then and then to have the apparatus of an actor where you see the tool set you have and start looking at the text and the dialogue and the story for, as an actor's point of view, it just all these like fireworks went off in my head. And I just devoured all these plays. And then I started to write at first just like little monologues for myself or other actors or little like teeny one act scenes that they would do in class. And I could just, I had a knack and I loved that feed loop of either sitting in an audience seeing somebody do my work and just seeing what works and what doesn't and being really objective about it, having that instant feedback or writing my own monologues or my own scenes I would do with other people and have it to be like how to express myself in a play that I'm writing but also as an actor and to be there sort of steering it. And I was just like, my God, this is why I was like put on the planet. And it just really, really clicked for me. So I hit pause on all the shitty screenplays and shitty TV shit I was working on and I went in uh, sort of like a, a nine-year rabbit hole with uh, with theater and then eventually started a theater company with a bunch of people in the class one of whom is my wife now and you know we started uh, we our first production I wrote two one act plays I wrote a play for her where she played a like uh, teenage pregnant girl with her boyfriend in Dover New Hampshire and these two guys and it was great because it was like these are voices of people I grew up with I just Mm -hmm. have never seen them in a play and I never saw them done on TV properly so she played against this other buddy of ours Jeff Ellingson and they were it was just like a lot of banter and they were trying to decide whether or not they wanted to circumcise their kid and he's just like a towny idiot guy you know like all I don't know how it is with you it's like all the guys I grew up with that drew me fucking crazy now that I'm separate a little bit like I can have that perspective on them and really mine them for comedy and pathos now that I have that little perspective you know what I'm saying so anyway, we did that, and then my wife and I, and girlfriend, we started dating, and she got pregnant real quick, and it was like a blessing. It was amazing. But I had to shift gears and make real money. And as an actor, I was shooting commercials and stuff here, but certainly not enough to support the family. And then I worked for a different agency doing PR for video games. I kind of fibbed my way into that and had great... You know, I've, I've always been really lucky. I've worked with really great people who so this is, So this is your... <laughs> was this Rogue Machine... This is pre-Rogue Machine. This is pre-Rogue Machine. So okay. we started out uh, a company called Jabberwocky mm-hmm. um, with a group of folks, and we made we did two or three productions of one-act plays. I wrote most of them, and then we got a couple other ones. And everybody, all the actors in the company, it was called Jabberwocky. We had a 501c3, and we'd do these productions. We'd go rent a facility. And mm-hmm. then my first full-length play, I wrote this play called Lost and Found, and it featured as an actor like everyone in our... <laughs> In our company, there were eight mm-hmm. characters, and like seven of the core members were in it. 
And uh, so I put an ad out on – it was either Craigslist or Big Cheap. I don't know if you know what that yeah. is. It's a user yeah. looking for directors. Got a couple of responses, and then we got a response from this guy. He's like, I've done some TV. I'm looking to get back into it. You want to meet? And I was like, oh, this guy in TV sounds cool. And it was John Flynn, who's the artistic director of Rogue Machine. So we met with him. He directed the play, and he, you know, he's like, look, man, you guys are precast. And then he read the play, and he really, really liked it. It really, it really kind of struck his nerve. I mean, it was, it's not the most elegant play ever, but it's very raw and truthful, and there's great characters in it. It's, it's definitely overwrought. Um, you know, you learn. So he did it. Did a great job. He uh, had, I mean, John like Flynn really changed all of us. Brought us to a whole other level. Brought a professional guy to do the set. We raised the money for it. Ran at the Lounge Theater and we extended. And it was great. It was a wonderful experience. So a short time after that, he started Rogue Machine. With, and he they kind of absorbed our 501c3. Mm-hmm. We kind of became the umbrella, and then it turned into Rogue Machine. All those original company members became Rogue Machine, and it sort of took off from that. And, you know, John has sort of all these different facets that he knew people, and he kind of brought them all together. Mm-hmm. So that was sort of the beginning of that. So – there, there are a couple things that I've I found really fascinating. I just about. talked for a long time, by the way. Sorry. Well, you know, this is an interview with you, so okay. it's all good. It's your only chance. Yeah. Uh, Another thing too is like I get two kids at home, so I I can never complete a thought. So yeah, it's like I'm an adult now, so I'm really <laughs> taking advantage of that. Uh, so you write and you act, and I find it I find it really interesting that it sounds like the way you're talking about your journey so far is that these two things kind of coalesced simultaneously yeah uh you weren't growing up yearning to be an actor and then you're like oh maybe all right like you know like it's really interesting to me to see how these two things come together and uh what little i know about you is that you have written these great plays that have had um these great lives that have moved on to new york and you're Mm -hmm. in them too like have you had to Perhaps not here in L.A., but, like, for example, Small Engine Repair goes to New York. Did you have to fight for your own place in your play? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. that. So it was a huge hit in L.A., and there was a big, big uh, producer and a huge director. This guy, Joe Mantello, right? Mm-hmm. He wanted to do the play. I went out there, and he had a reading with great actors, his version of like our ensemble out there. And they were awesome. And I went and saw the reading and it was hard because I wrote that role for myself. I did it for, you know, eight months out here. Mm -hmm. But I was like, okay, it's going to have a life. It's going to be really good. And had that happened really quickly, that would have been the end of that. Joe would have directed it, maybe gotten a couple celebrities, maybe even done Broadway, who knows. But he certainly would have done an off-Broadway version of it (coughs) and with the intent of maybe. How did he get it in the Uh, first place? I think uh, one of the Rogue Machine Company members did. I mean, it had a good, pretty good representation at that point, and it floated around. But yeah. I think uh, a company member might have is a good friends with him, and and then hooked him up or something. Yeah, uh, yeah, totally. One of those crazy. things. Yeah, I, I mean, look, it, it sort of gets out there. I, you know, I, I've seen the evolution. That was t- 2011 to now. I've I've really seen. Having two plays that go from L.A. to New York, I've really seen sort of how the L.A. perception has sort of shifted. At, at first, it was like a black mark against you, mm-hmm. a snobby kind of thing. And now it's like not as much. Um, so but that did, thing didn't kind of work out. And then John Bernthal, who was in the original cast, he, you know, his, his, he was really taken off. He had so much going on. And he and his dad has this uh, production company. And they said, hey, let's move it ourselves. And we found some enhancement funds. And we're like, OK, we're going to do it. And then uh, Jeffrey Richards was a producer of it, um, and he hooked us up with MCC. And at that point, it was like, all right, let's do it. We're going to do it our way. And it was, we're like, you have to take uh, John Bernthal and myself. We're acting in it. Mm-hmm. Take it or leave it. And they were like, saw the reviews. They knew of us, especially John. They were like, okay, rock and roll. We want to do it. And you know, we, we would have been so happy to bring the original cast over, but that's just – it's a whole other story. It's just – it's it's – you know, it's difficult. Um and and then with Lost Girls was was I didn't I wasn't a producer I wasn't in Lost Girls in L A although my wife was and some and my good buddy Josh Baton and a lot of friends were in that that I would have been more than happy to have that move intact but just the logistics of of moving a play from L A to New York it's breathtaking how fucking expensive it is to do a play in New York mm-hmm. New York has a certain bandwidth uh, not bandwidth like a certain uh, requirements of names 
that will make people go that they just kind of need, even off-Broadway. I think the saying is that like off-Broadway now is what Broadway was maybe 10 years ago, whereas you just need a couple people that you recognize and people go to. Now Broadway needs like fucking stars. Everybody, yeah. Crazy stars. And off-Broadway is what Broadway used to be, whereas like you need the more recognizable, the better. You need like, I mean, that's just kind of how it is to get people to go because it's a competitive landscape and it costs so much fucking money to do it. But, you know, so for small engine repair, it was a little longer process. So we kind of built our, baked ourselves into that deal. And then Bernthal ended up booking, uh, he's fucking funny, man. It's like, because he called me, we did auditions. He's like, all right, I don't want you to worry. I had a screen test with Brad Pitt for this movie, The Fury. It went so fucking bad. I'm <laughs> never going to get it. Like, seriously, just, I'm telling you, because we're buddies, but like, put it out of your mind. And then, of course, he gets the part. Right. Which was awesome. And he went off and did that, which was great. And then, you know, we, we had new James Badgedale as a good friend and, and, MCC was a huge fan of him and wanted to do it. I mean, that's the thing is, is like when you make a play yourself, um, you can do your own thing. You can pretty much cast who you want and, and get that done within, you know, it's always a collaboration with the directors and everybody and mm-hmm. the producers. But then when you go and people are putting hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars on stuff, you know, they, they have more say and you have to respect that. And, and uh, I mean, I was always fortunate at MCC. They were great partners. They're casting directors. It's Bernie Telsey and Will Cantler and... and and those guys and Jessica Chase and and they're awesome, but they're you know there's a reality uh, over there in terms of what they usually cast in in order to get the buzz and whatever. So yeah, I mean, I think the trick is is you have to cast awesome actors, obviously, and if an actor, quite frankly, has some other built-in cachet beyond that that'll help you draw audience members then that's great when this happened when you got uh, small engine repair because that, that was the first of the two right that right, went correct. to that went to New York did you feel like uh, a certain level of achievement like, yeah I, I mean look what I've done <laughs> yes uh, I mean that was being on stage when small engine repair was about to go on and just being in that play I mean that was the, the singular most satisfying creative moment I've ever had in my life and of course, there's been many, many other things from then. But that was sort of, and the director Giovanni, Andrew Block did it in LA. Giovanni did it in New York, and I was able to sort of, you know, combine both of them. And, and Giovanni and I especially really, really clicked. And uh, I had never felt more on stage. I knew exactly what I was doing, and I was out there, and I was like, I don't give a fuck if anybody likes this or not. This is it. This is what it is. And the actors were great, and we just clicked, and the set was great, and everything. So I felt so in it so present and I was like this is the pinnacle I mean you know I, I've never felt anything like that uh, it was amazing yeah there's a uh, I'll tell you I'll tell you their name off air but there's a very popular playwright I, I met a couple years ago at this uh, at a like a conference thing I was mm-hmm. I was at and uh, we were just talking about New York theater and he was like uh, he knew I was living I lived in LA and, and we were in New York at the time and and he said, oh, man, the best thing that I've seen in New York in years actually came from L.A. It was small engine repair. Oh, really? Yeah. Well, that's great. Yeah. And I was like, oh, that's, that's cool to hear. It's cool, man. I mean, look, that's the advice I ever give any writer is build it and they will come. Now, small engine repair, like I said, I'd written a couple other plays and, and I, I kind of get like, fuck it, I want to do my shit unfiltered. But small engine repair was the first thing where it was so hyper specific. This is literally me if I didn't move out. These guys are composites of my two best friends growing up. Growing mm-hmm. up, I just added water and let that go out of it. I everything that's in that play, I feel passionately about. It brings me to tears to think about this, and I just wrote it, and I didn't filter it. And I was, and I, I know that world, and I was such an authority on it that I said, "Fuck it, I can tell what I want to do." And it was my wife produced that as part of the late night show, where it can be edgier, it can be crazier. I mean, when I wrote sort of the ending of that play, I mean, I was like, Jesus, can I do this? Fuck it. I got to be fearless. It was the most fearless I'd ever been as a writer Mm -hmm. and the most uncompromised. And it paid off in the sense of like, this is me. If you let me do exactly what I want to do as an actor and as a writer, this is what I will do. And I thought that was a really good lesson for me to learn as opposed to saying, you know, you see a lot of plays that I feel like they're written because they say, I really want the critics to like me. Mm -hmm. Or... And, you know, you and I can relate this. Or they're like, I'm writing for all the theater majors that I came up with who will get all these references. Whereas I wrote that, the idiots I grew up with, if they sat in the audience, they would see it. And Mm -hmm. they'd be like, fuck, I get it. Mm -hmm. And it operates like 
there's there's all that theater shit. You do the work, you do the craftsmanship, but on the at the same time, it's still enjoyable A to B to C, and you can follow it, and it's like get immersed in it. Like I love theater. The theater I like to create, for the most part, is like a visceral, emotional gut reaction. Not bratty, not all that stuff, but not you know, you makes you think for sure. But I I, I mean, the best compliment I ever got for small and repair specifically is just like I forgot I was watching a play. And I think that theater has the power to do that, and I just I love that, I love that. And then you know, uh, with Lost Girls, it was it was it sort of shifted gears. It was different, you know, it had a different reaction. Um, it was a much more vulnerable story. It was much less. It was really interesting to see those two plays actually, and they both did really really well in New York. I think Lost Girls is more challenging in the sense of its female protagonists. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you have a woman at the lead of that. My wife, actually, I wrote the role for my wife. She did it in L.A. for a long, long, for like six months, and then that moved out. That was tough, transitioning to a new actress, who was a great actress, but it was, you know, that was, you get emotional. We do these plays because we, like, love them, and then when you go off and do something else, it's like, it's just hard to see that a little bit. Mm-hmm. But it's part of it, and, you know. Again, I'm not complaining. I, I'm very, very lucky. To right, do it's it. sort of letting your child move away from home. You know? A little bit, yeah. Uh, but especially Lost Girls was a really hard one for me. That was a very, very difficult experience in New York to see it um, because it's such a specific personal story, and it's not. It doesn't have that super bombastic, crazy, roller coastery twist. That small engine repair. For, for anybody who's listening who doesn't know the the plot to. Lost Girls, can you... Sure, sure. So Lost Girls, it's really just a very small... It's an intimate story. It's about a, a woman, you know, three generations of teenage mothers, and this woman has her daughter, goes missing during a snowstorm. She lives with her mom. She and her mom have to deal with it, and then they enlist the help of her ex-husband, the father of the child, who comes over with his new wife, and they're just... A lot of the past comes up as they're terrified. This is a very New England thing. As the snow is piling up outside, where's our daughter? Mm-hmm. They find out very early on that She's not. She stole the car and she took off. And then there's a parallel story of two teenagers, two 16 year old kids in a motel in Connecticut, falling in love. And it's sort of the end of a relationship and the beginning told in parallel. But, but you a, don't actually know they're parallel. You don't know. I mean, yeah, yeah, right. Exactly. You don't. There's a, there's a sort of a twist to it, of course. Uh, that to me, like, just the intent was to sort of deepen the experience of that to see, to really pull you into, again, we're talking about young love, is that when you fall in love when you're 16, especially if you have, like, a dysfunctional family that you're coming from that maybe isn't giving you the the love and the, the groundedness that you require, you will latch on to someone yeah. and pour everything into them. And it's dangerous. It's white hot and it's dangerous. Yeah. And it's beautiful and you'll never have anything like it, but it's it can be... It can consume you. And it's sort of like that thing. Just a very natural, real thing. And uh, But, yeah, it was hard doing that play up and having, uh, you know, especially in New York. And, again, it was really, really received well. But sometimes I would just feel judged by it because it's like this is a small town story of just super real people. And they're just peeled away from, like, where we grew up. But then you have the, you know, sort of the New Yorker uh, theater crowd going in. And, you know, uh, I remember I heard some comment uh, – something about the working class and this and that and how hopeless they are and I'm like no one wakes up and says I'm hopeless they're like they fucking work it's like we talk about you get a job that's what you do you're not like oh woe is me you're like this is how that's how fucking 95% of the world lives like that yeah it's not they're not unusual it's not a statement about them so that sometimes that kind of stuff pisses me off a little bit the thing I loved about Lost Girl I mean I just didn't see I didn't see it coming like I was so invested in in the story, you saw it in L.A. or New York? I saw it in L.A. Yeah, oh, yeah. scene to scene, moment to moment. I'm just, I'm just there with it, and uh, and it's the simplest, it's just the simplest reveal, right? And you're like, oh, of course, right? Uh, well, thanks. Of course, these are two different, you know, these are parallel stories. Of course, these are them right. at a different age. Right. I should have known that, and I loved that I didn't. Well, I loved good. that I was surprised by it, and I, I said, I remember, I remember sitting at the Rogue Machine going. I said to myself, oh, that motherfucking could write. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Well, you know, I think that's uh, I think that's part of the gift and the curse of growing up somewhere where you didn't necessarily have the nurturing to just, uh, oh, what are you doing? What do you want to express? Oh, let's all sit down and read what, what he just wrote. You know what I mean? You have to fight for it. And when you create something, you're like, I'm going to Trojan horse some shit in here 
that you don't see because I want an effect because I know you I always think of an audience as like I really want to value their time and not to be an asshole like look if someone sits down in an audience to watch a play and they don't want to like it they ain't gonna like it they're just not very rarely can you win them over however if someone wants to like it they'll like it no matter what too but there's that sort of middle ground where you're saying like look you're gonna sit here I'm going to take you through something, but I'm just going to make you... I just want you to feel... Not even that you got your money's worth, but it was time well spent. Like, you had a meal. Yeah, you trust know, like me. Stuff. Trust me. If you sit trust there, me. you're going to get the meal. And yeah. so so the I, I think the challenge becomes, especially now as I, you know, you go forward and, and look, and like now I'm, I'm writing a ton, you know, for other people. I'm getting paid to do it, and that's great. But you have that guidance. You have it like, okay, I'm working for producers or you know, uh, you know, big actors or whatever, and you do what you want to do. But at the same time, you have to be cognizant of the the needs of the piece or whatever, mm-hmm. or of the job. Whereas with theater, you sit down there and you're like, what do I want to do? What do I want to say? You know, it's uh, it's really the fullest expression for me as a writer to do what I want to do. But sometimes that is like a challenge because where do you start? You know, where do you go? Are you getting are you getting screenwriting work because of your theater success? The theater stuff was a springboard. It got me uh, my sort of breakthrough Hollywood job, which was to write the screenplay for Stronger, um, the Jeff Bowman thing for the Boston Marathon. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I, I, a Small Engine Repair, Lost Girls, and were two great writing samples that got me a ton of meetings to see what's going on and, you know, offers. And, I, and I, I, you had to really fight to prove that I could write a script and I did a, you know some rewrites and some other smaller things and then with Stronger it was the first job where I came up with the pitch I worked with the producers I was so lucky because the guy the people I worked with were like incredible especially one of the producers this guy Scott Silver who's been doing this like forever he's so smart and he's from Massachusetts so like we really clicked mm-hmm. and he was he just kind of really mentored me through not this is how you have to write it but this is how movies are told let me help you get there quicker than you would Mm -hmm. sort of on your own. Let me help you interpret studio notes and all that stuff. Like, uh, amazing. And he's one of my favorite writers, period, in terms of, like, his screenplays read like any beautiful piece of literature. And they just, they're just so deep and great. So uh, doing that, having, A, a movie that I wrote, Greenlit, and then it got, like, on the fucking blacklist and all that shit. And then the movie was produced. It had a movie star, and the movie had all this uh, script had buzz, and the studio heads would read it, and they're like, okay, this guy knows how to write a screenplay. Now, I was, like, very fortunate because I got to write a story that takes place in my backyard, and I got to do my unfiltered take at it. And I, I don't expect every job to be like that. But I got really lucky in that sense. Again, if you let me write this screenplay, this is what it's going to look like. And then I had mentors from the producers and from like Scott to say, let me harness that enthusiasm and that voice into something that looks like a studio movie. Mm -hmm. And then so it really clicked. So because of that, now I'm getting, you know, a career and Mm -hmm. I'm working, you know, past couple of years, like pretty much nonstop in the uh, in the feature space and some TV stuff, too. My big challenge now is like, you know, for theater. Uh, which fuels me, and as an actor, which fuels me as to sort of how to be like a happy, you know, creative person. So you're listed on IMDb with a role in Stronger. Right. Do you, is that just like a small... Yeah, it's just a little thing. It, that's a whole... I'll tell you the... I'll tell you a much bigger story offline about that. It's kind of an interesting thing. Yeah. But uh, yeah, that was... Uh, you know, the director and I really clicked. Like, I love that guy. And the, one of the producers, uh, Todd Lieberman, he knows I'm an actor. I don't know if he's seen me in a play or something. But he was like, dude, we got to get you in this movie. But um, it was just, it's like a Chicago Blackhawks fan. It's funny. Like, just an asshole. Like, the whole scene is that, like, the family's there, and they got box seats at the Bruins. Yeah. And, you know, uh, the, the scene was originally written that the game is going on, and I took, like, actual footage from the game they were there. Like, I cl- you know, in the dialogue. Yeah. But we can't, you can't shoot at the Bruins during a game. Or if you can, it costs, like, a gajillion dollars. Yeah. So now it's like... I had to rewrite it so they're in the box as as fans are coming in. So Chicago Blackhawk fan, I play this idiot with like red paint, go up next to the box and they like start ball busting and we just swear at each other. Because you know how there's like that oh, low, yeah. low, like you go to the, you're just always in an argument, always like two degrees yeah. from getting into a fight. Um, it's like almost every time I'm in Boston, I'm almost into a fight. It's like almost unavoidable. It's just how it is. It's a fun thing. It's like a culture thing. It's like dueling. Well, I kind of think that uh, most, I don't know, I, I lived about 10 years in Boston and oh, nice! Before moving to LA, and uh, the the energy that I'm very used to 
the male like the, yeah. the male bravado is they 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 don't want to fight yeah. they want to get as close as possible <laughs> yes. to actually fighting and both sides really hope that someone's going to come kind in of prevent us. so yeah. they don't have to say no yeah. They want. They want. Somebody wants somebody else to come. Well, in and, and then stuff. that. By the way, you hit the nail on the head. It's like you know, if you get into a fight with a dude at a bar, that your buddies are there, and it's not going to get too crazy. Yeah, it's like one of the things to move into L.A. was so hard because like I don't, I didn't have that big group of friends who would do that like without question. And L.A. is like so much more of a dangerous place in the sense that oh yeah, someone will just shoot you. Yeah, or whatever. Yeah. I, mean, I remember playing basketball and seeing a dude like get stabbed, and I was like, all right, that's what we got here. Call the ambulance and shit, and it was like. <laughs> It's a different world. Yeah. There was hardly any argument. It was just like, bam, and then the guy took off. Anyway, uh, where were we? Yeah, so I play that little thing. My wife has a great role in it, too. So. Oh, yeah? Yeah, I mean, like I said, David Gordon Green was just like an awesome guy, and you know, uh, he's just – he's such a cool, fun director to work with because he just believes in like the energy of it and like the family quality of it and like, hey, it would be great to get this and this in. Like he, he – yeah, he, he makes movies and, and tells stories in a much different way than I do, and it was, it was really kind of cool to see that. So as you continue to write these screenplays, are you are you do you audition anymore as an actor? Are you? No, you know, uh, I, I kind of miss that. I mean, look, when you're an uh, an actor in LA, you're kind of like a professional Parker because mm-hmm. you just drive around and park and go to auditions. Especially, I made a lot of money as a commercial actor for a mm-hmm. long time, so I don't do that anymore. It's just too time consuming, and you know, for uh, I don't really audition for a ton of stuff. It sounds so lame. It's just ridiculous. I don't really have as much time. But if something really great comes along, I'll go in for it. But I'm at a, you know, I, I just, I mean, I have friends and people I know who are will say, hey, do you want to play this in something? And I'll do it. But I'm sort of making up a little bit for lost time. <clears throat> I have momentum right now. I'm trying to really mm-hmm. leverage the writing stuff. I, I had an audition a couple weeks ago. It was great. But it's going to be a really big thing for me to kind of put the time into it at the present you know, and in the next year, uh, I'd like to – a couple things I've written that I want to be in that I'd like to either direct or produce and be in it and kind of do it that way. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Um, I do miss it. I miss especially acting in theater. But there's some stuff coming up. It, it's just time. You know, you got a new baby and my wife's very busy too. And it's just about the time, you know. But I don't have time to run around for like guest stars in shows that I hate. Right. You know, but as yeah. a paycheck. Like I just – I'm making my money elsewhere. Right. So what is the um, what's the dream now? Well, I mean, to me, uh, it, you know, it's about balance, and I, I, you know, I'd love to continue writing plays. I mean, I plan on always having theater in my life, and you know, writing a combination of great paycheck, cool project, studio stuff, and then I'd like to get more into directing smaller things that I love and that I want to do. <laughs> um, I've also been working in the TV space for the right thing if that comes along. I mean, I, I, I think, you know, I'm very, very fortunate. <clears throat> I worked really, really hard, but now I'm in a position where you just got <clears> to <throat> find the right canvas to do stuff. Um, and, you know, I, I have learned that when I am working as a paid writer, as a screenwriter on something that I love and I feel passionate about and I can bring something to it, I'm fortunate enough that I don't have to take everything that comes to me so I can pick it, the stuff that really gets me passionate. Or pays a fuck ton of money, mm-hmm. um, which I'm not quite at that level yet, but I'm working on it. You know what I mean? Uh, so I think it's it's balance. I think it's juggling, spinning all those different plates, and then and then doing it. You know what I mean? It's like, you know, I haven't made a lot of money on these sort of passion projects. Let's find something that pays a little bit better. I mean, look, <clears throat> I'm in the I'm in the mode right now <clears throat> where I'm recovering from 11 years of primarily theater work. Mm-hmm. So it's like I'm trying to get out of that hole. You know what I mean? And try to try to get uh, some money and pay off the fucking IRS and mm-hmm. so uh, yeah that that's sort of where I'm headed. I mean I have a <clears throat> I have a new play. It's going to open up the beginning of next year. Yeah, I saw <clears throat> it at LATC. Yeah, so it's a period piece, right? It's a piece that I workshopped a lot at Rogue Machine, and you know I'm still part of Rogue Machine. I have a, a, a the play I want to write that I've sort of sketched out in my head will be a Rogue Machine play. Who knows when we can do that? Maybe next year. I don't know. It depends how quick I can write it. This play I wrote, I, mean, I, I believe it or not, I started this play like five years ago or six years ago even. And it's gone through so many different drafts, <clears throat> changed so much. 
but it's evolved into something. Like I literally learned how to write plays as I've written different drafts and put it aside. I mean, I'm sure you have stuff like yeah, that too. Yeah. So this is one, and then I was in New York doing small engine repair, and I gave it to Joe Bonney, and she just fucking loved it. She's like, oh my god, this is like I love this. this is my favorite thing you've ever written. She did Lost Girls again, and we, you know, she was amazing on that, had a great time. But the whole time she'd be like, so what are we gonna do with Worlds of Seconds? And I uh, workshopped it a lot with her. She came out for a week at Rogue Machine, and we did a workshop for a week, and then we had uh, two readings of it, which was awesome, and then went back to the drawing board and started to do it. So I'm part of this uh, L.A. theater thing called The Temblers, and it's uh, seven L.A. playwrights. And it's sort of the initiative of it is playwrights who we all, for the most part, have lives in other places like Rogue Machine or, or different theater companies or whatever, but we're looking to, as an, uh, a sort of a, an L.A. experiment, to each of us give one original play over a span of four years to get produced at an equity level at LATC in partnership with Latino Theater Company and those guys to do it in one of their spaces. And then after we've done our play, we'll step out and bring a new playwright in. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but, they're, you know, it's a very diverse group. It's all people who are kind of like, like – let me put it this way. can't speak for anybody in the group, but for me, it's been easier for me to get my plays produced – at Off Broadway in New York City than it has for me to get produced in LA at, you know, Kirk Douglas or Geffen or any of that. Mm-hmm. Like, no consideration on them. Like, I can't even get them to go to my readings. I mean, I like them. They're all good guys, but they, there's a little bit. I, I, I think if you're an LA playwright and you're in the 99 seat equity waiver space, which is awesome and super and vibrant, you're getting a lot of love, but then you, there's a gap there. And in L.A. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to kind of like, you know, rules of seconds will be done with like a 200 seat house and, you know, do like an equity run and see how it goes. And so who put that group together? Who conceived? You know, I got asked to be pulled into it. Um, It was sort of like um, it kind of started with a couple people. And then it got, you know, as people came in mentioning these other things, it sort of uh, there wasn't it's weirdly um, sort of just happened. Mm -hmm. Uh, I don't know exactly who started it, whose initial idea it was. I mean, it's sort of modeled after some other cities doing this type of thing. Like the welders in it's D.C. It's exactly what it's like. Yeah, very yeah. similar. Yeah, I mean, almost every city had something like this, so yeah. we created it. And look, I, I'm, a, I'm a real, real proponent for diversity in terms of everything, but it's specifically in terms of writers. You know, I'm, I'm really interested to hear different people's perspectives that tell a passionate, well-told story. Mm-hmm. So that was really exciting to be part of a group that has – and they're great writers. And sort of the concept behind it is, is, is you know, you have seven really, really solid, well-produced, experienced writers helping dramaturg each other's work, mm-hmm. be there for each other, support each other. And, you know, my play is the first one up. So it's going to be a little bit of a, an experiment for me. And then, you know, we have other ones lined up, and, and this stuff's great. And Kemp was in here a couple months ago. Oh, is that right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Kemp is, uh, yeah. Yeah, he's, he's one of my best friends. And one friends. of my grad school professors uh, is in the group. Oh, Oliver? Oliver, yeah. Oh, yeah, I love that guy. Yeah. So that's like, you know, it's like great talking to you and get to know you because, again, coming from New Hampshire, I just didn't know many writers. And I still feel like I don't know that many, you know? So it's great to be around people. Yeah, so what's it? What's it? I feel the same way. Like, uh, that was the first thing that sort of locked me into who you were. Like, oh, this guy's from... And you, at the time, um, you were doing marketing at Rogue. And I was like, oh, here's this guy. <laughs> he's doing marketing at Rogue. Which I was I'm, terrible at. He's like this New Hampshire guy. And I'm this New Hampshire guy doing marketing at this other theater yeah, yeah, yeah. in L.A. That's so cool. Yeah. And then I've watched you kind of... Uh, take off over the years and it's been pretty awesome and I've only been completely jealous over the years. <laughs> well, we'll see what we can good. do to change that. Um, but uh, what's, it, the, what's it like to go home? When you go home right. now, do you feel uh, at home? Do you feel a disconnect? Do you slide back into like this person you were 20 years ago? Yeah, I mean to some extent. I mean like it's interesting because I remember before I moved to LA uh, a bunch of the buddies I grew up with like I've known since the third grade, they, you know, they, they, they partied a little hotter than I did. And I was like, fuck it guys, I'll, I'll take drugs with you. Cause I was always like, I don't want to, uh, I don't want to do any crazy shit. I was like, always such a control freak, you know? And so I took ecstasy with them and, uh, it was like one of the fucking most fun I've ever had. Cause <laughs> I, it's so hard for me to like let loose and now I got kids, it's a different thing. So that was a funny enough, that was like a deeper bonding experience that was sort of turned the corner with a, a, like this group of friends that I feel like thought they thought I was trying to be too good for them. But the reality was, is like, I'm trying to figure out who I am and I don't want to get caught in this. It's like you, 
you're so afraid to get stuck in the place you grew up in mm -hmm. that you kind of reject it. And then you leave and you look back and you're like, how much you love it. And it's that yeah, balance. Yeah, there's something about I it. I just didn't know how yeah. to balance it. Now I feel like I get to balance it better when I see these guys. I was in Boston shooting that movie and I hung out with a bunch of friends. And it's just great to see them, you know. I mean, it's just great to see them and you talk about the old days and stuff like that. But, you know, I don't. You know, they don't they don't say, Hey, what's it like doing this and that? I mean, it's just you know how it is. It's New England, you don't. I mean, my parents, I think, you know, they're they're into stuff, but like I brought them to set and they were like, Yeah, this is cool. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think they're about as proud of me as if I had like a good job anywhere, which is fine. They're not uh, oh, we did research and we found out this and this is and we can't I mean, they'll go to like the movie and they go to my plays and they'll say, Oh, that you know, that was really good. But they just it's just a different thing man it's just that new england thing it's not like so what was going on so i noticed the you know the thesis underlying you know it's just that you don't get any of that no and there's not a, there, there's not a lot of talk about feelings oh definitely not you don't go there it's not I'm, it's not really relevant my, you know my dad is like he'll 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 get like good scotch and like a cigar and we'll just sit down there and we'll talk and but it's not you know that's how he says i love you and he's proud and yeah. we'll talk about you know trucks and shit like that but it's not yeah it's not, uh, whereas like other people I know, <clears throat> creative types whose parents grew up or were, you know, just more uh, kind of intellectual or whatever, may dissect the stuff they wrote or whatever. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I'm fortunate that they don't have that. I mean, they go, they co support it. You know, my family's always come down to New York. And I mean, I had like, I had three sisters and every one of them visited the set of Stronger. And uh, it's funny because like my oldest sister, uh, She's pretty tough, and she went and saw. She was there the day it was like a really gory bombing shoot of the big scene. Mm -hmm. It was the only day she could come. I was like, it's not the best day to come. Everybody's gonna be really intense. It's explosions. You can't even like see what's going on. First of all, everybody goes to film sets and they're like fucking bored out of their minds. Yeah. But she went and they sit in there, brought you know her her daughter and her her grandkid and her her boyfriend and shit, and they're sitting there watching the monitors and it's all bloody. And she pulls me aside and she's like. You sure people really want to see this? I mean, you're kind of fucking rubbing the faces and like this bombing. Like, does anybody really want to see it? And I was like, no. It's just a little part of the movie. It's like just a little thing. It's not like the whole thing is wallowing in that. It's like funny. And then she's like, yeah, you know, I hope you're right. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. I'll see it. I'll see it. I'll see it. <laughs> you know right, I mean? right. But it's like kind of cool to have that, not someone just blowing smoke or doing whatever. You know, it keeps you, it keeps you grounded. It's who you are. And, you know, it just is what it is. And well, then they go to the plays and they like it. And, you know, my mother's always like, Early on, she'd be like, I liked it, but you need so much swearing. Stuff like that, you know. <laughs> I just made her sound like an old Jewish mother. She's Moms are great, though, aren't they? Yeah. yeah. What, uh, what was your connection to Boston before this screenplay came about? Like, did you feel like Boston was your city? Yeah, I mean, you know, growing up in New England, Boston's like the epicenter. And, you know, I grew up in Londonderry, right near Londonderry, Manchester area. Yeah. And uh, I think... Boston, I used to work in Boston, and I think I'd get there in like 35 minutes with very mm -hmm. little traffic. I mean, it took me longer to get from my house to here to do this fucking podcast than it would take me to get from my front door to Boston when I worked. So, no offense, I'm not trying to make you feel bad. I'm just <laughs> saying that's L.A. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, you go down there and visit, of course, all the sports teams and stuff like that. And where Stronger takes place primarily is in the town of Chelmsford. Yeah. Chelmsford, which is only about 20, 25 minutes from where I grew up. So I felt really close to that. And it's sort of the composite type thing. I mean, what is Boston? I feel like, you know, you meet somebody in a bar, you're like, yeah, I'm from Boston, even though you're from like Wakefield or, right. or from, you know, Concord, New Hampshire or something. I mean, that's, it's so, New England is so small. It's like one big kind of place. And in Boston, you know, good or bad sort of dictates the sports and all that other stuff. It is the epicenter of that. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. With all the, you know, you, although I do like the Manchester Monarchs minor league team. <laughs> it's a hockey team, right? Yeah. Yeah. Actually, I think they're gone now. Oh, that's too bad. We used to go to the Fisher Cats. We go to the, all those minor, those minor league games are fun. You go drink. Beer's a little cheaper and like you bring the kids. Everybody has a blast. It's I used to go like, to the New Hampshire, uh, the Nashua Pride. Nashua Pride, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, my family's from Nashua. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Nashua's cool. Purple Panthers. Yeah. Know? I remember Nashua. You guys were pretty good at uh well, I, I grew up well i grew up in i grew up in keen right so uh i don't i don't know would you were you an athlete growing up yeah we i played, played everything we might have played sports against each other yeah no i i played everything i played uh uh basketball uh lacrosse i was way into lacrosse for some reason uh i played football like I my played, freshman i played football year. we were too poor for lacrosse <laughs> my school oh really yeah. school didn't have it yeah. we didn't have it no. yeah we had a good team uh i mean they weren't good 
we'd get that was a whole, such a hard thing is like in public sport uh, public school you're always dominating sports like football basketball whatever and then you because at these private schools you're like Phillips Exeter and just spank them but lacrosse those fucking flock of seagull haircut motherfuckers who had all the money yeah. and were, whose parents sent them away they would just destroy you in lacrosse like nothing you could do and it's just because it's it's one of those preppy wealthy man sports they would just destroy you yeah I think this is the only this might be the only episode of this podcast I ever do that's gonna end on a comment about lacrosse <laughs> <laughs> it might not ever come up ever again in the history of uh of the subtext you never know yeah but anyway thanks for coming oh, in no, thanks man. for it was doing my pleasure. this it was good talking to you it was good talking to you and too, uh man. i'll talk to you more offline yeah sounds good we can talk about the real stuff yeah <laughs> Thank you to John Polano for listening to me blather about all my insecurities. And here we are at the end of another one. Thank you to Bill Bordy for funding At This Stage magazine. Thank you to LA Stage Alliance and Danny Oliver for making the subtext a thing. Thank you to David at JTB Recording Studio for recording this podcast and making it sound awesome. Thank you for following us on Twitter at Subtext Podcast. Thank you for emailing us at the subtext podcast at gmail.com and thank you for being you here's a secret only for those of you listening to the very end play this episode backwards and you'll hear the theme song from the last unicorn mm-hmm.